Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Bill Emmett, Editor-in-Chief of The Economist from 1993 to 2006, and currently Chairman of an educational charity, The Wake Up Foundation. His new book is The Fate of the West, The Battle to Save the World's Most Successful Political Idea. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Bill. Great to be with you. What is the West, obviously the central character in this book, what is the West as you conceive of it? The West, as I conceive of it, is any country that follows a liberal, open model of, of uh, society and uh, so- social organization and that uh, protects that uh, openness with a form of political equality, which we call liberal democracy, but is the open Equal citizenship that the Greeks talked about uh, thousands of years ago, isonomia, uh, an equal political voice, political rights. It's a a liberal model, but it's not geographical. It's not uh, cultural. It's about that balance between openness and equality, in my opinion. And that that definitely includes someplace like Japan. Would it include Hong Kong? It would not include Hong Kong because Hong Kong doesn't have political equality. It has the rule of law, but it doesn't have political equality uh, because it's not a proper democracy. It's under – despite the uh, uh, one country, two systems uh, uh, structure of China, it's nevertheless under Chinese control. So I wouldn't consider it uh, part of the West, but I would include Taiwan. I would include South Korea and I certainly would include Japan. So you – You write that, uh, quote, a feeling of decline has set in in the western heartlands of the US, Europe and Japan. What do you see as the source of that feeling? I think that the principal source of that feeling is economic failure is uh, or economic disappointment, let's call it that. Um, economic disappointment uh, since the 2008 financial crisis, uh, most spectacularly, but actually also in the decade before then. Economic disappointment and failure in the form of uh, high unemployment, in the form of increasing inequality, in the form of declining real incomes for a very, very large proportion of the population. Population, and therefore, a big sense that uh, the good times might be over, that uh, the times when uh, each generation uh, of children could be expected by their parents to do better, to have more opportunities, to uh, hopefully be wealthier, but at least have uh, more freedom and more freedom of choice, uh, that that the suspicion that that might be at an end is what I consider to be that feeling of decline. I don't see it, therefore, as a relative issue about caused by the rise of China or of other emerging economies. I don't think that most citizens of the West think of their position in the world or their um, own life prospects uh, as being in some sense relative to uh, that of a country far away like China. Maybe geopolitically uh, strategic thinkers may think in that way, but most ordinary people don't. I think ordinary people think about their economic prospects, their social status, their the prospects for their children, the sort of opportunities they're going to have. And I think that uh, – really in an accelerating way after the financial crisis of 2008, the sense has taken hold that uh, perhaps um, an era might be over. Now, I believe that sense can be wrong, should be wrong, must be wrong, but nevertheless, that it is there, um, I think, is uh, undoubted. This is something I've been curious about because this – so this decline and the the stagnant incomes, um, the, the high unemployment, this is not – it's not evenly distributed in the US or Europe. Um, it's you know there are certainly categories of people in the U.S. say who are doing quite well. Um, it's it's kind of the working classes that seem to be largely in decline. Um, and I'm I'm curious when we say that we, you know it didn't used to be this way, and so post you know pre financial crisis and and going back a little bit before that that these people are doing quite well. But was this Kind of an anomalous thing. Like, do we does this sense of decline to some extent depend on overreading um, the the history of the success of the working class? Like, it wasn't for the you know the the Western ideal has been around for a long time, but the the time period during which a working class person, so a person of relatively low education, relatively low skills, could be comfortably middle class, is itself fairly recent. I don't think. 
really a matter only of the working class. I think that it's a matter of a very large part of the population, both in the United States and in the UK. It's clearly not a question of the top five and ten or ten percent, and certainly not the one top one percent. But uh, I think that uh, any definition of uh, of the working class is really something that's really quite a small group of people, uh, particularly these days with manufacturing down to uh, nine, ten percent of, uh, of uh, employment um, on both sides of the Atlantic, at least in Britain, France, and America. Uh, so I think that it this situation of declining incomes applies, I'm afraid, to a much wider group of the population than could be described as the working class. Uh, now, where I agree with you is to say that I think expectations um, are part of the issue, that expectations are high, uh, and that uh, some of the issue is about a disappointment of expectations uh, and of things that people have taken for granted, that we've all taken for granted as being, if you like, immutable parts of, uh, of uh, modern life. Uh, where I also agree with you is that I think it's really only in the post-war era uh, in which uh, this uh, sense of uh, – widespread adoption of, of an open and equal society, of widespread demo, uh, adoption of uh, open trade, of uh, open markets, and of uh, relatively limited government uh, has taken hold, uh, and that has spread to more and more countries around the world only in that post-1945 or really 1950 period. So it's in historical terms, it's quite a limited amount of time. It's really, you know, I'm 60 years old. It's my parents' generation um, in the latter half of their lives, but it's not uh, my grandparents' uh, generation. Uh, so it's a, it is a relatively short period, um, but um, that uh, the bulk of the British population have seen declining real incomes in the last uh, 10 years is true. It's not a working class issue. It's also not a working class issue only in the United States. Is that, was 2008 a particularly bad financial crisis or putting these countries in a particularly uniquely bad, historically bad situation that would require such a response as, as we're seeing or, or we would expect this kind of response for the illiberals, Ill, illiberalism that is creeping around. Because for example, I was thinking about for, for your home country of Great Britain, the 70s were pretty bad there um, with, with – especially with the – the 70s were bad here too, of course, but uh, 70s were pretty bad in, in England and – and that created a situation for calling for Margaret Thatcher. That didn't create a situation for calling for uh, a Donald Trump or Marine Le Pen type figure. So is there something unique about how the financial crisis in 2008 was either worse or the way it was bad? Well, I think that the financial crisis of 2008 was certainly worse. It was the worst financial crisis for 80 years. It was distributed very widely across Europe and uh, North America. It um, led to uh, or, or required an enormous response by government, both in terms of fiscal policy and in terms of monetary policy, that uh, – really drained resources from everything else. So I think that it was both the direct hit of that financial crisis, which uh, which um, you know really uh, has uh, really hurt people on both sides of the Atlantic, but also the fact that uh, with public budget deficits uh, at uh, seven, eight, nine, ten percent of GDP, with public debts jumping from 30, 40 percent of GDP up to a hundred percent of GDP and above. Uh, the resources were really drained away from almost all other activities, uh, whether they are healthcare, education, job adjustment assistance, uh, you name it, uh, resources have been pulled away from it. So that some of the longer term trends that uh, we were certainly all um, experiencing, like uh, the effect of technology on uh, altering distribution of, uh, of income, uh, the effect of uh, technology on displacing some working class jobs, the effect of an aging society, particularly in Europe and Japan, um, on you know, the balance of, of, of resources and of the p burdens it's been putting on healthcare systems. These things um, would have been there anyway. Uh, 
uh, we would have been worrying about slow growth uh, anyway. Uh, we would have been worrying about uh, the difficulty of dealing with these subjects anyway, but suddenly all resources were drained away. Um, uh, because everything had to be d used to uh, prevent an, a new Great Depression. Uh, and now we've been in a fiscal consolidation period of uh, where, uh, all, where politics has gone strongly against the use of uh, fiscal policy uh, in a stimulative manner, at least until very recently. Uh, that may be rightly or wrongly, but it does mean that uh, policy bandwidth has been basically taken away from other issues. And I think that, that is a large part of the legacy of the financial crisis. In addition, I would just add one other important legacy, and I think crucial in the political response, and that is uh, the sense that the financial crisis showed a disproportionate influence over public policy for Wall Street, for the banking sector, for finance, for the city, for the European banks in Germany and in France, that has fed into a belief that, quote unquote, the system is rigged, uh, that uh, not just it's not just billionaires who are able to uh, donate money to political campaigns and get a disproportionate income, but also that uh, public policy is distorted by these groups and that uh, the response after the financial crisis in many countries exhibited injustice. So I think that this has discredited liberalism to some degree, but also it has made the system, quote unquote, political system in particular, appear especially unfair, which has then opened up uh, the path for populist ideas that uh, are about addressing perceived weaknesses in the system, which include access to foreigners, uh, immigration, uh, include um, openness to trade because that displaces jobs allegedly, uh, and um, because of the disproportionate power of, uh, of uh, some uh, blocks of interest, um, corporate uh, groups and uh, oligarchs supposedly and so forth, that also uh, feeds into a um, really a William Jennings Bryan type populism that um, is now exhibited on your side of the Atlantic by Donald Trump and uh, on my side by, by Marine Le Pen and Nigel Farage. So why is the response that? So if you if if you're looking around at the the kind of global liberal order that existed in say the 1990s and and early 2000s and you think that it's rigged and that it's rigged against you. Um, and I mean, we certainly here at the Cato Institute spend a lot of our time pointing out all the ways that it is rigged by interest groups and people in power and corporatism and so on and so forth. But those, so those are all kind of legitimate complaints, um, and they have they have hurt people economically. That's legitimate. But then, why is the response not to Unrig the system, like okay, let's you know, let's figure out how to give big banks or big corporations less power, or let's figure out how to make it so that government's not rigging things in certain people's favor. Like that would be one response, but the one that seems to dominate with Le Pen and Trump is instead what we need to do then is now radically rig it in my favor instead. So we need to you know direct all the policies at propping up the the group that feels itself most hurt. America the, first. Yes. Why do we drift in that direction as opposed to the better one for all of just let's de-rig the system? Well, I think first of all, uh, countries have varied a lot in the way in which they've drifted since this crisis. Um, you know, we often comment in Europe about uh, how surprising it is that two countries that were worst hit by the financial crisis, Spain and Ireland, have actually had relatively weak um, populist responses. Both have had some populist uh, reactions uh, and um, a movement in this direction, but they haven't actually been strong enough to uh, get in or even near government. So then you have to ask yourself, well, why in America um, Trump and why in France did Le Pen get a third of the vote? Uh, she didn't win, but she got a third of the vote uh, in the presidential election, and more than a third of the vote. I think one answer is uh, a decade. A decade has passed uh, and um, patience uh, has 
um, sort of been stretched in that decade. The first response was, as it were, a relatively orthodox set of responses. And 10 years later, uh, we, we see a resort to um, a more extreme uh, recipes, if you like. Um, and one should say also that Barack Obama was perhaps the first populist leader, although um, a, a populist leader of a different thought, sort, maybe in response to the Iraq war more than uh, more than the financial crisis, since he coincided with the financial crisis rather than following it. Um, but um, he might have been, might be considered to have been something of a first American reaction to uh, some of the long-term issues that we've said. His Council for Economic Advisors highlighted a lot of the issues that the Cato Institute uh, also highlights um, about uh, consolidation of power, about um, rigidities in the labor market of uh, effective licensing of uh, state level and all of those things that have uh, that have rigged the system in certain ways, but he failed to get anything through Congress. Um, why did he fail to get it through Congress? Well, I would say probably because of the overwhelming effect of the financial crisis um, and that that sucked out all bandwidth and uh, uh, from what he could do. Um, and maybe there were other failings, of course. Uh, in addition, I think that um, governments on both sides of the Atlantic shied away at first from doing anything very radical about the banks uh, because they needed banks to carry on lending. They were um, afraid that the, the harder they hit the banks and the more that they reacted to the abuses that we'd seen, the worse would be the recession. Uh, and so I think that there was a... Um, uh, a definite reluctance to um, really point the finger um, where responsibility should have been pointed. Uh, that was true in many countries. It was certainly true in, in European countries as well through the euro crisis uh, where um, governments uh, connived really in helping banks conceal the reality of their situation and of the sins that they'd done and therefore were not willing to really um, – uh, take radical measures. Now, 10 years later, I think, and I would agree with you and the Cato Institute, that the time is ripe for now for more radical measures of the sort that uh, you've described and that I would describe. For the moment, the politics has gone in the opposite direction in your country, at least. In France, potentially it has gone in a liberalizing um, and de, uh, decongesting direction, but we wait to see whether President Macron can really deliver. Going into sort of France and Western Europe, and, and I think less so for the, the UK, but it struck me for, for many years, especially I, as I've been traveling around Europe for, for you know, starting my travels 15 or so years ago, every couple of years, that, that there's a trade-off that Europeans tend to make, and you write about this in the book, are more likely to make, I think, than Americans, where they trade off for stability over dynamism, especially when it comes to their daily economic life, their daily their working life. So, for example, you write about the kind of labor policies that are constraining the ability of people to get fired, for example. We had this problem, this problem that is really bad in France where it's nearly impossible to get fired. So it's very difficult to hire people because the cost is so high. And there's a lot of these things that the workers vote in that end up hurting them and make a very low growth weight, very non-dynamic economy. And I often say that if you're looking for this – and this, of course, has little to do with the financial crisis. You, it, you have a fairly stagnant – Spain, you have a fairly stagnant – especially uh, France. Like you have very, uh, Greece, of course, is a different problem. But if you compare – the level of public employment, that's another issue we see where there's a ton of people working for the government. And then the level of youth unemployment, those are two really good indicators of when an economy is kind of circling the drain or just not going to grow much at all unless we can remove some of these strictures that they tend to choose in Western Europe. No, I agree with you. And I think that um, many of those uh – Damaging restrictions really were response to the crisis of the 1970s, the one that uh, you rightly and accurately described as being being a kind of precursor of this one in, in Italy and in France. Uh, these uh, very strong labor protections were, were introduced in the 1970s in effect essentially to buy off um, th at that stage a rebellious, revolting uh, – Unit, trade unions and really a, a wider part of the population, whether it was the 1968 generation in universities and after, or actually just just you know massive strikes taking place in that time, they bought it off in what uh, seemed temptingly uh, 
um, attractive away, but has become more and more damaging as time has gone on. Uh, I cite in the book a, a kind of general fact, which is that um, until the 1980s, mid-1980s, unemployment in Western Europe had since 1950 always been lower than in the United States. Uh, in the 1980s, it overtook the United States and it has stayed higher than the United States ever since. Uh, and those and labor laws seems, are the reason. And it basically uh, seems essentially. like... Um, now, we now see an effort to try to reform them, uh, finally. Uh, Spain has done it quite substantially, but you know, in the depths of a financial crisis, and therefore it's going to take time to see the effects of it. But um, it has done it. Uh, France now has to begin to do it. Um, uh, Sweden did it uh, in the 1990s um, and has uh, liberalized its labor, labor system rather dramatically compared with the extremely rigid system that was there before. So it can be done, but it's certainly tough to do it. And uh, I think a major part of what we're going to see played out over the next 10 years is is, uh, which, is the question of which countries in Europe can actually succeed in in modernizing uh, their labor labor system uh, in order to uh, achieve the, the dynamism that they used to have. Yeah. Uh, Japan, by the way, has uh, some degree uh, gone through the same thing, but it it has it has dealt with its. Uh, rigidity in its labor system by creating a larger and larger pool of, uh, of uh, very unprotected and very and very uh, sort of discriminated against uh, workers who are now 40 percent of the pop of the labor force uh, so it's it had a, got a, an extremely dual divided labor system now so we've all faced up to this uh, but I would agree with you some have certainly dealt with it better than others does the youth unemployment rate in some of these countries uh, I'm, I haven't looked at it recently a, a few years ago I did look at Spain's and I think for 18 to 34 it was almost 50 percent um, does that that seems incredibly concerning on in terms of the this the books right now how much pensions are going to cost in the future but if we're not having young people being able to work in these countries because of the labor market restrictions uh, this could be uh, be a very like very long slow and painful decline that actually may not look terribly different than Greece than what happened in Greece at the end well I think that you're absolutely right that it is very concerning uh, so I think that issue is going to be a crucial one in Europe I think in Spain we probably should accept that they have made very considerable reforms to the labor market, and we are in a probably in a lagged effect of the uh, of the um, financial crisis. Still, there are youth unemployment has has fallen quite substantially from its peaks, but it's still ridiculously high. Um, in Italy, um, it's very very high um, again because of highly lab the rigid labor uh, labor system, and that. Uh, is not being improved. So I think it's going to be. This is going to be the battleground over which um, over which Europe now has to fight. Uh, Macron ran in his campaign by not proposing Anglo-Saxon or Anglo-American labor reforms, but rather Scandinavian style labor reforms, because they sound kinder um, and they sound more reassuring. Now he has to prove uh, that he can actually deliver on those um, and um, do what the Scandinavians have done, which is provide a, a, a very effective combination of uh, great flex greater flexibility with government assistance, uh, very substantial assistance in uh, adjustment uh, at times of, uh, of recession and, uh, and of job displacement. Uh, so that's the flexibility and the security, what they call flex security. That's what he promises to do in France. Now he has to deliver on it. What does that look like in practice compared to the way that it's handled in the US and UK? Well, compared with the U.S., it really essentially means spending a serious amount of money rather than um, rather than a derisory amount of money. Uh, I mean, U.S. spending on uh, job adjustment assistance is uh, really very tiny by OECD standards. Uh, and of course, you have a very, very large country, so it's extremely difficult to have a focused and concentrated uh, uh, way of doing it, I guess. Um, whereas in small country like Denmark or in Sweden, uh, they devote considerable resources to uh, to that kind of retraining and um, and uh, job adjustment uh, assistance, helped perhaps by the fact that uh, they are all all part of a broader European economy that in most periods, but not very recently, has uh, allowed 
trade and uh, and um, economic dynamism to be imported, even when they were in in their own bad times. Um, so they've had some benefit of, if you like, the scale effects of the European Union. Um, that is not so true today because of the uh, the, the the long Euro um, sovereign debt crisis. Um, but um, it's really about that concentration of, of of greater resources. Do democracies tend to? Uh, put off problems. It seems that uh, the kind of adjustments you mentioned that will have to occur in Europe will affect a lot of people who vote, and and they will be said they will be told, for example, we're going to make it easier to fire you. Which I think, if I remember correctly, Sarkozy tried to do in France, which was one of the things that created some riots in the streets. If I remember correctly, those those reforms are pretty unpopular usually, unless there's some pain to be had. So democracies. Because the way politicians react to voters, they tend to put off the debt. They put things off onto their on, onto their children, and if the politicians don't have to deal with it, they won't. But the as we talk about here at Cato, a lot of time the the fiscal reality of say the pension obligations and the elderly population in Japan, for example, which I believe in the next few years will have one centenarian for every newborn child in Japan, which is an astounding fact uh, that these this is going to be a really hard reckoning and the democracy simply will not deal with it until it's a crisis. Well, I think that democracies uh, do uh, two things. One is that they certainly try to put things off until the, after the electoral cycle, of course. So does everybody, by the way. I think dictatorships do that as well. But, um, but nevertheless, it's clearly a particular problem of the electoral cycle. But secondly, the problem of democracies is that a pro is that a an entitlement once given is extremely hard to take away because every receiver of that entitlement, whether it is a farm subsidy or corporate welfare, or a uh, social security entitlement, um, or Medicaid, or you name it. Every receiver of it has a vote and they feel desperately uh, angry at any thought that it will be taken away so that we have a, a particular rigidity uh, built into our systems in the way in which uh, handouts go out there um, and then are extremely hard to uh, to re to dismantle and reverse, as you say, absent a crisis or absent some very helpful form of uh, trade-offs as happened with the Reagan, famously with the Reagan tax reform. Uh, but that happens only once in a, in a, in a blue moon. Uh, so it is tough, I think. And uh, we and democracies have got to try to uh, push harder on some of these uh, these trade-offs. I think Margaret Thatcher did it very well in Britain in the, in the 1980s. Uh, really bulldozing her way through a lot of entitlements and a lot of privileges. Uh, and we've got to see some leadership of that sort um, coming through in, in other European countries and um, hopefully in the United States as well. Populism, even in Western countries, is nothing new. There's always been people who agitated for these kinds of anti-open society policies, anti-trade, anti-open markets. Um, but they just seem a lot more powerful than they used to be. Um, is that – were they empowered by the financial crisis? Do you think more people have just kind of joined those movements because of this, this feeling of decline? Um, like why, why does it seem like the, the elites have lost the level of control over the conversation that – we used to have that's then enabled these movements to be far more successful than they used to be because it's you know, uh, you know Trump Trump won but he in the U.S. but he won with a, a minority of the vote um, he he powered through the the primary system but it was you know in the past it feels like elites could have kept that stuff in check and they can't anymore is that. Is that a more universal thing than just this instance? And if so, why? Well, I think that um, it, you don't really need more than the uh, biggest financial catastrophe in 80 years that risked producing a, a new a repeat of the Great Depression of the 1930s. You don't need much more than that to explain why populism is doing has done well in the last 10 years. Populism is uh, an ever-present factor. Um, it has been around for hundreds of years. Uh, it is a response to stress and response to perceived failure. Uh, and the elites, if the elites are described as the governments and mainstream political parties, delivered a financial crisis and then delivered the slowest economic recovery from that um, 
uh, slump that had been seen in the post-war era, uh, one that coincided with declining real incomes for the average person uh, and that in your country have driv- have, have, has coincided with a big uh, decline in labor force participation and uh, uh, particularly of prime age um, working males. So I, I think that um, that there is a populist response and that there is a, um, a, a market politically for populism should not be seen as at all surprising. The question is why haven't established parties um, been able to respond in more effective ways and deliver um, better goods, better uh, better prospects, um, and thereby win some of these, uh, some more of these votes. I mean, I suppose the, the real answer is why haven't they managed to win all of these votes since populists have had, in fact only been elected in a very, in a very small uh, set of countries. Um, most obviously your own, uh, the United States, but uh, they haven't been elected um, actually to government directly in Britain. They haven't been elected in France. They haven't been elected in Spain. Uh, They haven't been elected in Germany. They haven't been elected in the Netherlands. They've obtained a foothold in power in a few countries like Finland and Austria and uh, other countries. But where they are, where they are is as in most countries is as is as a large pressure group at around 25 to 30 percent of the of the voters, rather than um, a majority, I think that um, the United States outcome uh, in uh, last November has to be seen as being a prospect of a series of, uh, of uh, accidents. Uh, but the fact that is that the the political system of the United States was was as it were, um, in a state that was susceptible to such accidents uh, and such a series of accidents. I think, by the way, the same can be said of Britain's decision to leave the European Union. That was an accident waiting to happen because we never really had a had popular support on a widespread basis for our membership of the European Union since 1973 when we joined, um, uh, and that at any time when a referendum had been held, there would have been a a, a serious possibility that we would that voters would would vote on balance to leave. Um, the question is why was a referendum held in 2016 and the, the reason for that was a series of political accidents uh, that uh, led to a government feeling obliged to do so it wasn't because of a massive demand from public opinion for a, for a referendum um, so it i think we in our democracies we are capable of having these accidents but then once uh, a decision is made like brexit once a uh, an administration is elected, as with the Trump administration, uh, then consequences um, develop and can lead to the situation spiraling in a new in a new way in a new direction. Of course, um, in Britain, by the way, we are really, although we have a lot of rhetoric about wanting to be an open global nation, actually, there's quite a lot of protectionism being talked about, uh, and I'd say it's an open question as to really whether the outcome of this decision to leave the European Union will be towards a more a still open society or whether it will actually lead to Britain becoming more protectionist. Is inequality a problem or, or more specifically, I guess, is it a problem? Is it part of this problem um, or is it contributing to this uh, decline of the West or liberalism? Well, I think that the way I think about inequality is that it's not a problem arithmetically or uh, you know depending on a particular measurement on the Gini coefficient but it it is a problem if insofar as it uh, gives rise to a widespread sense of injustice and um, dissatisfaction with uh, with the the political system as a whole um, so it has to be correlated with a with a grievance about injustice with a sense that barriers are, have been raised to um, social mobility uh, that inequality is kind of producing entrenched advantage uh, that uh, that um, you you're much likelier to be able to get your children into a good college um, if you are uh, very wealthy rather than not, that uh, you are liable to have a big influence over public policy if you are Google and you're contributing to uh, um, a lot of uh, congressional races rather than being um, uh, an ordinary Joe. So I think it's it's that sense of grievance about the system and the sense that it that um, advantages are going to become entrenched and become permanent that is the problem with inequality does it you write a lot about the differential voice in politics by the wealthy and uh, and 
but then you also write about things like the pensioners and, and the political blocks we've already discussed. Does, does it really seem like the wealthy have a disproportionate voice be, do, when you look at the large welfare state that we have? I, mean, I hear this conversation a lot. Oh, that's clear that the wealthy get their way in society. But in America, even in America, we have a very generous welfare state. Uh, we've been increasing minimum wage. We, we haven't been only passing policies that quote unquote benefit the rich. Uh, we've been passing – and the same thing is true in other countries. Does, it, it, doesn't there a lot of impact from the voice of the voters – and the, and the ones who work for the government, the ones who want those employment restrictions kept in place, as we discussed, that seems to have a really big impact too, and maybe more than the wealthy. No, I wouldn't single out only the wealthy. I don't in the book either. I think that uh, interest groups, um, in a well, the way in which Mansur Olson described them in The Rise and Decline of Nations and in his previous works about uh, interest group politics and the dynamics of them, um, are the problem that they uh, set up uh, as great big uh, roadblocks to um, to uh, a sense of equality and to uh, the smooth functioning of, of uh, the market and of the smooth functioning of a democracy and that um, it's those that need to be cleared away from time to time. The wealthy are among them, however, um, because they are an interest group. They are an interest group that wants their taxes reduced uh, at, at, at every instance. Well, not, um, not even all of though, them. Uh, perhaps because they, of course, pay a large proportion of taxes because they are the wealthy. But uh, there is never a time when a tax cut for the wealthy is not a, um, a, uh, a desirable um, uh, call <laughs> as far as they're concerned, of course. Um, and uh, the same with, as it were, corporate wealth. Um, the sort of the, the monopoly uh, position that um, big companies have that uh, give them uh, the ability also to influence public policy over whether or not they should be regulated and whether or not they uh, they should be uh, subject to antitrust investigations and so forth. So it's that form of, of, of uh, advantage for the wealthy that I'm talking about. I'm not being Marxist about this. I, was, it, I mean, there are a lot of people who are wealthy in America. I think the last I checked, this changes periodically, but there are more millionaire uh, Democrats and more billionaire Republicans and the millionaire Democrats may be okay with raising their taxes. I, I don't – you seem to think that the positions of the wealthy are, are fairly monolithic. Well, I'm sure they're not. I don't think the positions of any uh, lot of individuals are absolutely uh, are monolithic. I think uh, – Certainly in your two-party system, the Democrats have a lot of wealthy people supporting them. And indeed, one of the reasons why Hillary Clinton uh, was uh, not supported more than she was appears to have been the fact that she was considered to be like both uh, highly wealthy but also tied to um, very wealthy donors and very powerful uh, Wall Street financial institutions. Uh, now, clearly, she did win the popular vote, but she didn't win enough to win the uh, win the presidency. So we're talking about um, tipping points here rather than uh, rather than mega influences. But uh, you know, th that was the issue on the Democratic side as well between Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton. Good point. Good point. I want to talk about some of the prescriptions that you have uh, in the last chapter of the book, some of the ones that I thought were pretty interesting. Uh, the first one is uh, openness is all, but it's not everything. and er Not everything has to be open all the time. Can you explain what that means? Well, what I mean is that uh, while openness is absolutely the important virtue of, of our societies in stimulating growth, uh, competition, new ideas, um, all of the ingredients of our progress, I don't think that it is, um, as it were, a theological uh, requirement that everything has to be open. And in particular, I think that capital flows uh, were require some regulation. Now, that doesn't mean I want to go back to um, the old days of exchange controls and uh, of uh, restrictions on the amount of money that we can carry abroad when we're, when we're traveling. But I do think that um, we should not be theological about um, complete openness to uh, flows of the most speculative capital and of uh, theological about uh, allowing uh, very highly speculative capital to be unsupervised and um, not subject to, reg to uh, forms of forms of regulation and particularly reporting requirements. So I think that some adjustment of, of openness on capital um, is required and, and, and indeed a breaking up of some of the big banks, I, in my belief, is required. On immigration, I think it's a, it's a, a, a subtler 
point that I'm trying to make, which is that uh, while I am actually very much in favor of um, open borders and open immigration, I recognize that politically the citizens of a nation state have the right to have a view about who should be entitled to come and live in their country, who they should share their political rights with, and that it is not democratically legitimate to um, have a debate about um, the volume of immigration and indeed the nature of immigration. So I don't think that we as liberals, as uh, as libertarians, can have um, an absolutely kind of uh, principled position on, on immigration. Um, I would argue always in any debate for more immigration rather than less. But uh, I recognize that uh, there's some contradiction between that and the belief that um, everyone is – uh, created equal and believe and is able to um, have their own the, the, the an equal voice um, in the public policy decisions of of any given country. You write that uh, quote equality is all, but it isn't all about money. What do you mean by that? What I mean by that is that um, I don't think that we should uh, have a target for the distribution of income. Uh, saying that we need to take from the rich and give to the poor simply for the sake of it, but rather that. The, what's the, uh, really at issue with equality is a sense of justice, a sense of uh, social mobility, of equality of political influence and political voice, and that uh, inequality can get so out of hand, uh, in particular when it gets tangled up with interest group politics um, and the way that we've discussed in this uh, in this conversation, um, it will need and can require some government intervention. Uh, particularly investment in in ladders of equality uh, to uh, redress um, the, as it were, natural outcome of of the democratic and um, and uh, economic uh, markets. Uh, that uh, inequality is something that, uh, from time to time, but not always, uh, public policy has a legitimate um, reason to uh, to at least lean against. Um, some of the extremes of inequality. One of my favorites is a boring consistency is a fine goal for economic growth. It's a, it's a, it's a well, good there phrase. I'm mm -hmm. arguing against the sort of uh, miracle mongers of um, among populists who say that what we're going to get is 4% annual growth uh, forever because I think that um, going for – Going for really rapid growth usually leads to policy mistakes that then produces a boom and bust cycle, which uh, ends up on average uh, with you um, suffering. So I believe that um, a consistent growth, uh, depending on the capacity of the economy of uh, one and a half, two percent, two and a half percent, depending on you know, the demographics and the and the and the productive capacity of the economy, is the sort of thing that a government should uh, target rather than. Um, miraculous um, uh, escapes from uh, from uh, previous stagnation into um, new um, il illusory uh, periods of magnificent growth. <laughs> and you uh, defend free speech, which uh, which over here on this side of the Atlantic is a pretty hot topic with our college campuses and we've discussed on a few episodes of Free Thoughts. I'm not sure what the freedom of speech discussion is currently in, in Great Britain, but you write that freedom of speech is a vital bridge between openness and equality, not a trade-off between them. Well, the the debate on college campuses is, is also very uh, active here in Britain. Uh, and the, some of the same syndromes of uh, seeking to uh, choke off uh, discussion um, for political correctness reasons have also been something of a virus that has gone around British universities and that really needs to be argued against um, in, in my view. But also I think that uh, the open debate, including an open Scrutiny of where the of what are the facts and what is what is what is truth and what is uh, what is what are the bases of our discussions um, are and are the essential groundwork for um, being able to um, run an open society in a way that is is uh, not socially divisive that is that leads to groups accepting. Uh, the trade-offs that need to be made and accepting the sacrifices that they may seem at one stage or another to be making. Um, free speech, free information is an important lubricant of that in my view. Are you optimistic um, that we can we can right this ship or 
I guess at the very least, stop dismantling it and throwing pieces overboard as we sail along? I am optimistic. I, I believe that we, uh, because we are open democratic societies, we have the capacity to correct our mistakes and we have uh, an evolutionary strength that allows us to uh, make mistakes, to, uh, to injure ourselves, but then to adapt to new circumstances. And I believe that is what we're doing. I think that we can damage some of the structures of international law and treaties and alliances that have helped to protect our, our international system. And we can make life easier in how we behave for some of our unopen and illiberal uh, um, let's call them rivals uh, around the world, which of course I mean China and Russia. But in the end, I believe that we will be back, that we will be able to restore much of our or some of our dynamism and that we actually still have a lot of things going for us. We just need to pay real attention to um, where our problems have, have arisen from and uh, form a consensus, which institutions, fine institutions like the Cato Institute contribute a lot to doing, form a consensus about what needs to be done. Thanks for listening. This episode of Free Thoughts was produced by Tess Terrible and Evan Banks. To learn more, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.